Hi everyone, it's me! And today, Five Nights at Freddy's. Let's uncover the mystery one more time. Together! Mm. Oh, it's over! It is finally over! The thing that's been burn. haunting me for over two years is finally dead and buried. The Fazbear uh. Frights book series. 12 books, 36 stories, 2,912 pages. Yeah, oh, you no. bet I counted each and every page of that thing. No more do I have to waste my nights reading page after page after page of tepid, warmed-over horror for the tiniest scrap of lore. No more will I be forced to try and convince you that the books are important tools for solving the games, actually, guys. And no more will I have to write the words FASGOO WTF into my notes. I get to go back to being a gaming channel again. In Minecraft, Zelda, Pokemon. Yes, of course, I want to read these seven Hello Neighbor books. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess all I have to do now is wait for Security Breach DLC to roll out and... Uh... No. 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 Come on. Hello Internet, welcome to Game Theory. The Hello Internet, welcome to Game Theory. Hi. <laughs> Show that's basically book theory in disguise, because there's now another FNAF book series in existence. Oh, it physically hurts me to say that, but Tales from the Pizzaplex is a thing that apparently exists. The first book came out a month ago, and there are now three more due before the end of the year. I just love it that Matt Pat is like angry, but... <laughs> Is that like, three more? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, how is it possible to write so many books? Scott, my dude, I appreciate the hustle, but maybe just spend a little less time on your literature empire and a little more time making a game with a cohesive narrative. <sighs> Who am I kidding? He just used the time to release more Funko Pops. You know, all those essential characters to the franchise, like... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Essential. Essential. Hmm. Radioactive Glow Foxy. <laughs> I just can't. Regardless of my feelings about the books, one thing I will say is that they've led to some of our most important theories to date. So, despite my better judgment, I read the new one so you guys at home don't have to. And I gotta say, I was surprised. This thing is a roller coaster ride. In this singular book, you have one emotional gut punch of a story that's probably the best in the entire FNAF series, one incredibly gruesome story where people are physically being ripped apart by Glamrock Bonnie, and one where the entire world dies of cancer because a girl wanted to play FNAF AR. That last one, by the way, is barely an exaggeration of the actual story. A girl goes to the Pizzaplex and hops into an augmented reality machine which causes everyone else in the entire world to develop cancer and also give birth to translucent goo babies that eventually swallow the girl whole. This is a product that really exists in the FNAF canon. It's likely that what's really happening in this story is that she's trapped in the AR machine and all of this is happening inside the prison of her own mind. But uh, let me just say that the story leaves it very vague. Anyway, I just saved you 80 pages of reading stories about kids dying of cancer. You're welcome. So in the aftermath of all of this, this, I've rummaged back through the old box of theories to come up with three mini theories for you to chew on. Two that clarify major points from Security Breach, and one that gives us an idea of where the game's DLC is gonna take us next. To get there, we're gonna be covering lore. So much lore. Game lore, book lore, real lore, Ballora. More lore than your brain has room for. So get ready there, Laura Croft. Today, we've got ourselves three theories at Freddy's. Let's motivate this episode with a controlled shot. Shock. Theory number one, Security Breach's animatronics aren't possessed, except for Freddy. Maybe some people already thought of this, maybe have never really questioned it, but if I'm right, this would be a huge deal because it would be the first time in the series that the main animatronics don't have spirits inside of them. This was something that really stuck with me after our last episode on The Blob, and I figured we should probably discuss it here, so uh, let me take you through my thinking. First, consider this. Who would be possessing these animatronics at this point in the series? Security Breach takes place after the FNAF 6 fire, a fire that, as we spoke about last time, worked as Henry intended. As a quick reminder, Henry set the fire to purge all the remaining spirits out of Molten Freddy and Scrap Baby. And he was successful in his project. They're gone now. That's why the puppet mask inside the blob has no more tears, and why Baby's eyes are all extinguished. What Henry didn't account for, though, was agony. The way I see it, the blob is a collection of agony that lingers on inside the older models of suits and endoskeletons. The rage that remains even after the spirits pass on. So, if I'm truly right about that, all those past victims have been laid to rest. They're gone. They're removed from the franchise off the lore table. So, if not them, then 
what spirits would be inside the rock stars. Well, the only other option are the nine missing kids that we see in the newspaper article during the game's bad ending, and honestly, that's just too many. We only get six new animatronics in this game. Freddy, Monty, Chica, Roxy, Daycare Attendant, and MUSIC MAN! <laughs> MUSIC MAN! <laughs> too long. I specifically did this episode just so I had an excuse to do that. I suppose you could say that there were seven, if you count the two sides of the daycare attendant, but still, that is two oh. spirit short. But you don't have to take my word for it. The game outright tells us this itself. About a month ago, Reddit user Seriously Unserious posted a big research doc breaking down the opening cutscene of the game from the perspective of a computer expert. This was research that they were doing for a video on the Rye Toast channel, which, shout out to a fellow FNAF theorist, love your cat by the way. If you've never heard of Rye Toast, go check him out. I mean, when you got thumbnails like this, you know that this is a channel coming from a great creator with some really smart stuff to say. Anyway- Oh, the self-praise. Map Hat is right. Thankfully. <laughs> In his Reddit post, Seriously Unserious looks at the glitch trap virus for example. It's a joke, it's a joke. Please don't be angry, it's a joke. It is a joke. Please don't be angry, okay? Exactly what it is, a computer virus. Going into the specific details of how viruses work and seeing how it affects Glamrock Freddy. You see, computer viruses don't live independently within a system. They have to be attached to something, usually a file or a program. And when said program runs, that triggers the virus and allows it to run. And believe it or not, but we actually watched this process happen at the very beginning of Security Breach. Notice how when we're looking through Glamrock Freddy's HUD, we get a glimpse that he's in show mode. There's an integrity bar and we get a line that says test run. Also, you'll notice the command line interface here where the primary folder is named System32, which has always been associated with the 32-bit version of Windows. Oh. In other words, Freddy and the other animatronics are PC Master Race, baby! <laughs> but as we all know, no! very shortly into Freddy's performance, he stops dancing and begins to glitch out when he gets triggered by a child that's out in the audience. That's what mm -hmm. we've covered in the past. But one thing that we've never done is look through these five seconds at a quarter speed to actually watch the cascade of events playing out that ultimately result in Freddy's crash. In no way, man. How you actually slow down the entire footage, dude. Wow. That's a lot of research, man. Much respect to you. Inside the System32 folder, Freddy runs a program named git568. We also see this happen in the code when the command line heat869 pops up. Heat vision or thermal vision. So it would seem like the git program is telling Freddy to scan the audience and look for a kid to potentially grab. Eventually, there's a second command line which loads in some other programs and runs tests. All of these tests come back with a negative result, except for the last one, which receives a Y. Yes. And that's when the program starts to crash. At the same time, Freddy supposedly finds Gregory in the crowd. This then prompts Freddy's program to define rule X. Looks like the code is searching for what it's supposed to do in a situation like this. We don't know what that rule is, but we do know that the next step is to return warning 79, which is when we see the word warning pop up in the HUD. Freddy then goes into overdrive and the whole thing aborts. It tries to init task, initialize a new task, but this is met with a void response, meaning that it's not getting a response from Freddy's RAM. The next line then tells us alloc overload, which shows the virus trying to reallocate resources in Freddy's memory, but there's an oh. insufficient efficient amount, which causes SW.failure and Freddy crashing to the ground. After that, he's booted up into safe mode, which is a way to boot mm -hmm. up a system that uses only the bare essential programs. Yes. <laughs> Get it? Bare? Because he's a bear. You'll notice that Glitch Trap isn't a problem for Freddy throughout the rest of the game, which tells us that the Glitch Trap virus is actually housed as a part of show mode. It's a non-essential program. This is why Freddy's in the clear for the remainder of the game, but the other animatronics are suddenly in Kill Gregory mode, because once the show's done, Glitch Trap activates. It's funny, but in a poetic oh. twist, the Glitch Trap virus caused Freddy to glitch, crashed him out of show mode, which in turn rendered Glitch Trap unable to corrupt his system. It's only after the corrupted parts of the other animatronics are added to Freddy that we finally see Glitch trap able to get a stronger hold over a system but oh oh i just love it that map had included the the end the engineering the coding aspect of of this nerdy stuff into his theory it's like wow that's actually quite brilliant thank you so much map Hat. thank you Let's go back to that allocation overload that prompted Freddy's crash in the first place. Normally, this is caused by a lack of CPU or RAM, but why would it crash mm -hmm. inside of Freddy and not any of the other animatronics? What else could be taking up the valuable disk space inside of Freddy? Well, how about the soul of Michael Afton? Why else would oh. Freddy suddenly not have enough resources when all the other animatronics work fine? It's because he oh. has something inside of him that they don't. The spirit of someone else. A spirit that starts to show activity once he sees Gregory out in the audience. And while we're on the subject of dead kids, 
Cheese. Theory number two, Gregory. Everyone's favorite robot kid was built using old parts of staff bots. I know the whole Gregory is a robot theory is already a bit controversial, but like it or mm -hmm. not, robot kids have been an accepted thing inside this universe since Charlie had four versions of herself hidden behind closet doors in the initial novel trilogy. And where there's a robot kid, there also tends to be a box that they can pop out of. Again, case in point, Charlie. And wouldn't you know it, but the new Tales from the Pizzaplex book doubles down on both robot kids and boxes with not just one story, but two. In the second story, Lally's Game, Selena's about to marry the love of her life, Cade. They move into a new house, and while unpacking, Selena sees an old trunk that belongs to Cade, a box that Cade insists is full of memorabilia. Surprise, surprise! It's not memorabilia at all, but rather yet another robot kid, Lally. Yeah, Lally is the robot child that's on the cover of this book, but that visual is actually misleading. Lally does have the childish facial features and is around three to four feet tall, but he isn't purple. Rather, he's meant to be white with black joints. Anyway, once again, we find ourselves with a robot child that's locked away inside of a box, one that is specifically mentioned to be related to the pizza plex. But it's another story, frailty, where things get real interesting. In this one, we're given yet another robot girl, Jessica. But Jessica's built a little bit differently. Around her neck, she wears a heart-shaped pendant that has healing properties. When she shaves off parts of that pendant, she's able to heal sick people around her. As the pendant gets smaller and smaller, rusty, oily metal junk begins to mysteriously appear around her until, once the pendant's gone, Jessica just becomes a pile of scrap. If that story sounds vaguely familiar to you, it should, because the exact same thing happened in the second ever Fazbear Fright story to be beautiful. In that one, a girl named Sarah finds Eleanor. Fazbear frights his version of baby in a junkyard. As thanks for rescuing her, Eleanor grants Sarah a wish. Sarah wishes, as the title of the story suggests, to be beautiful. Each morning, Sarah wakes up to have yet another part of her fixed. The only stipulation is that Sarah keep wearing a mysterious pendant. In the end, Sarah takes off the pendant and collapses into a pile of rusted old garbage. She had been rebuilt piece by piece by Eleanor, looking and acting like a human, but held together by a pendant made of remnant. Until the pendant came off, the illusion was broken, and she turned back into trash. Jessica, in this new book, appears to be yet another victim of Baby's scheme. However, there's more to frailty than just human-looking metal, because I don't think Jessica is just made out of any old junk. I think she's made out of very special junk. At the very start of the story, we get this line, quote, Jessica pushed the wet mop across the hospital floor, to and fro, to and fro. She remembered that saying from somewhere before, she just didn't remember from where, something from the past. Now alone, this wouldn't amount to all that much, but this forgotten memory of pushing a mop to and fro is repeated three other times throughout the story. It's one of those weird details that goes completely unexplained, has no actual bearing on the plot, but feels important because it's repeated so many times and mm -hmm. is so oddly specific. We do mm -hmm. eventually learn that Jessica's aware of her current state as a heap of junk held together by a magic pendant, and that it's all tied to a decision that she made sometime in her past when she was a normal kid with a normal life, but this specific memory about a mop? Nothing. She has memories of her past, sure, but the compulsion to mop? Yeah, she has no idea where it's coming from, which is why I suspect it's not her memory. Instead, I think it's coming from the memory of these guys. The staff bots in security breach. We have a number of mopping staff bots throughout the facility, all programmed to move their mops to and fro, to and fro, just like Jessica. Now, we know that Jessica's made out of junk. I'm not suggesting that she's just a staff bot in disguise or something, but we also know that there's a lot of broken and discarded staff bots underneath the pizza plex, and the pizza plex is mentioned in the story Frailty. So, what if Eleanor uses parts of these broken down staff bots as part of the junk to recreate Jessica, and the memory inside its metal has mixed with Jessica's own memories. Well, it would explain why she remembers the phrase, but not where it comes from. It would also explain a lot about Gregory's robotic origins. Now, that admittedly seems like a stretch, but stick with me. During our initial playthrough of Security Breach, I called out the strange presence of staff bots in two major secret rooms. First, staff bots are either mangled or fully dismantled in the secret daycare room. A lot of disassembled staff bots. I mean, this one's been beat up kind of like torn apart. This is a room that we theorized could probably be Gregory's hideout, considering that we see t-shirts hanging up alongside the walls, kind of like you would a closet, as well as the pictures that label a small child as me also posted on the walls. You know, looking back on this room almost a year later, there's another picture in here, my fun day with a big old birthday cake and me labeled right next to it. Just saying, the connections between this kid and FNAF 4's failed birthday party keep stacking up. Anyway, lots of weird beat up staff bots exist in here in a way that they don't appear practically anywhere else in the 
the game. The second place that we see beat up staff bots is in the most lore heavy room in the game, the post-it room down in the sewers. At the time, I was focused on the messages on the post-its with the one binary one that translates to why is I. This is what led me down the path of Gregory being a robot, and that the message was his first step into consciousness. But post-its aren't the only thing that are in that room. There are also hundreds of broken staff bot heads that are piled along the walls, not endoskeleton parts, specifically staff bots. At the time, I proposed that Gregory might have just been experimenting with the parts. It was just kind of a throwaway comment. But now, thanks to Jessica's connection to a mop bot, I feel like maybe the staff bots and Gregory might be more related than I initially thought. He's asking, why is I? Because his actual memories as the crying child are only just beginning to come back, clashing against the programming of the staff bot who was never truly alive in the first place. And it's why there are all these pieces of broken staff bots up in the daycare room. If he needs a repair, he can just use those parts because they're exactly what he's made from. Gregory has been pieced together with the parts of broken staff bots. All we need now to prove it is the heart-shaped pendant that lies underneath his striped shirt. Which means it's time we talk about the other child we see in Security Breach. Theory number three, the Security Breach DLC will be the official end of the Afton Saga. I and always come back. Nope, not this time, my friend. I feel real confident about this one. How do I know? Well, it all comes back to color. Color has always been hugely important to the franchise. Slightly confusing at times, but important nonetheless. So rather than looking at the poster for hidden eyes up in the corners or trying to figure out why Gregory might be on a computer monitor, I instead wanted to bring your attention to two specific color clues that have been given through this poster. First of all, the title. Take a look at that new logo we got. Security Breach Ruin. Security Breach, as you'd expect, is just the main game logo, but Ruin is purple. Well, this franchise is known for its use of bright colors, especially in the neon pizza plex, purple is always, always reserved for the Aftons. Obviously, both William and Michael are purple. In the Princess Quest ending, both Vanessa and Gregory are purple. Burn Trap's room is purple and so are his eyes. Purple is Afton's color. And so, with a purple logo and a room filled with purple lights, I have a feeling that what I predicted at the end of my last theory might come to pass. With Afton being absorbed by the blob, he's gonna take control of it and it'll be up to us to put an end to him once and for all. But how? We've used fire three times at this point and it's never once worked, so what else can we do? Well, we can use the girl on the poster. When I first looked at the poster, I knew that there was something fishy about her. This is weird. Why'd you turn black and white? That's too suspicious. You don't color in one part of your asset and then leave the rest of it black and white. First of all, let's take a look at the only color that we have to work with here, the shoes. Those lights mm -hmm. are pinky red, the same as the pink top of Elizabeth Afton, a little girl who happens to be close to Gregory's age. The girl in the poster also has pale hair, which would imply that it's blonde rather than brunette. There are definitely some level of physical similarities here, but Elizabeth, just like every other kid in this franchise, is dead. She got herself scooped by baby, so it can't possibly be her, right? Or yeah, my pet, you seem to be stretching it a bit too wide. Can it? I suspect that the black and white palette may be just more than hiding her identity, but also informing us to how she's gonna be here in the first place. In media, making something black and white usually implies that it's something from the past, maybe before color television, or just remembering something, like Christopher Nolan's Memento. Elizabeth being in black and white, while the rest of the image is fully in color, suggests that she is, in some way, a memory from the past. Now, I theorized last time that to beat Afton and his agony, you'd have to do what the Stitch Wraith did back in Fazbear Frights. You'd have to go Go inside his mind, find the good memories within the agony, and make the good memories stronger, essentially trapping the person within the happy memories to help the agony disappear. So if this is Elizabeth, well then that's probably why she's in black and white. She's a construct of when she was alive in Afton's memories. In the end, we might not be exploring the real ruins of the Pizzaplex in the DLC, but rather the ruins of Afton's own mind. A jumbled mix of rage and sadness, pizzerias spread across time and space, a life that has fallen to ruin. If I'm right, the DLC could be an exploration of every other key point in the timeline of these games, as we, the memory of Elizabeth, try to put our father to rest once and for all. And honestly, it makes sense for the narrative at this point. Afton was absorbed by the Blob. The Blob is a collection of anger from all of his past victims. For the first time, the two are truly interacting, fusing together. It's the narrative excuse to bring killer and killed together to explore the memories of those moments and finally give everyone peace. 
or revenge. One of the two. So there you have it, Steel Wool. I wrote your ending for you. You forced Afton upon us in security breach when we all thought he was gone, so you might as well do him some justice and give him the ending he deserves. This is the end of Burn Trap and the Blob, closing the book on the Afton saga for good, allowing for a fresh start in the next project, because it's finally time to give the fans what they really want, an AR game that curses the world into a debilitating illness and turns babies into faz goo. You know what? No, please don't do that. Please don't do that. That is just horrible. Very, very horrible. On second thought, maybe we just don't adapt that story yeah. for the games. But hey, that's just a theory. Three game theories. Thanks for watching. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I just love it that he mentioned that. But hey, that's just a game theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. No, no, no. It's not a game theory. It's three game theorists. <laughs> But anyways, I hope find this interesting and just quite creative that MadPy have been put in so much effort and hard work into making these sort of videos. <laughs> Chasing this series for so many years. Anyways, if you do like this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have any share of us. Down below, down below, down below. Don't forget to follow my channel I hope to see my next video. But hey, that's just a theory. But hey, that's just theories. Three game theories. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Bye-bye. <laughs> Subscribe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. Wow, that's a long video. 20 minutes plus. Sorry.